This morning's speakers had a common theme, uh, and it was how do we adopt Marxism to the modern world? Uh, he was an optimist, and uh, Marx expected in his time that capitalism would lead uh, to socialism. Uh, what he said was that capitalism actually was revolutionary because it had historical destiny. And that was to free European society and free societies in other countries away from the consequences of feudalism, of the medieval conquest of the land that had produced a landed aristocracy in England that lived on uh, land rent, uh, that created a banking class that was purely parasitic, making loans either to governments to wage war uh, and uh, then when they couldn't pay, uh, privatizing uh, the public infrastructure and raising prices. Uh, and uh, Marx thought that uh, industrial capitalism basically was uh, going to uh, get uh, rid of this. And he showed uh, in his uh, pre preface to Capital, he wrote a critique of political economy uh, that was a summary of his longer uh, three-volume study, uh, Critique uh, uh, Theories of Surplus Value. And what Marx did to begin his study was review the history of economics uh, from William Petty, Canet in France, uh, Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, and he showed how all of these economists did not simply describe how the markets work. That wasn't what they were trying to do. They were reformers. They wanted to change the context within which markets uh, operated. Uh, Adam Smith uh, went to France and he met the physiocrats uh, who said the problem with France is uh, the, the government, the royalty, the landed aristocrats take all the rent and people have to pay such a high price for rent that we have a high price of bread, everything coming from the land is high priced. The solution is to tax uh, the landlords. So Adam Smith, uh, who is now represented as uh, a symbol of free enterprise, was completely against free enterprise. Everything he wrote was a critique of free enterprise, a critique of markets. He said uh, that the landlords uh, had no moral uh, reason at all to uh, inherit the lands that had been conquered by military force uh, in the medieval period, and that uh, bourgeois society in Europe should uh, end up either socializing the land or taxing it. Uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, by the uh, mid-1848, uh, 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 said the same thing. Either the state uh, should uh, buy out uh, all of the land, uh, or it should tax away the rise in the land's value. Uh, and uh, by the time you had the Paris Commune in uh, 18, uh, 1871, uh, you'd already gone way beyond uh, uh, the 1848 revolutions. Uh, Marx didn't think very much of the 1848 revolutions. Uh, because uh, he said they've solved the problem of, of, uh, the, of criticizing the landowners, they've solved the problem of criticizing uh, the bankers, that was their, uh, uh, the Simonians in France, but they still haven't improved the conditions of labor. Uh, and so uh, the question is, since Marx was such an optimist, and yet today we, have, we find that capitalism is, is in crisis. Professor Romer has given a uh, very uh, good summary of the degree to which so uh, today's society is polarizing. It's not only polarizing, it's being reduced to austerity. Uh, economies are shrinking, uh, and I'll get more into that later. The economy is shrinking much more than the statistics actually uh, integrate. So the question is, if uh, things have turned out so uh, different from what Marx expected, if capitalism has not become revolutionary, if it's uh, uh, produced austerity, uh, was Marx uh, right or wrong? Well, the fact is, when you read uh, his analysis of how capitalism operates, his analysis is very applicable today. You have in Marx's, uh, in volumes two and three of Capital, Marx discussed uh, the uh, nature of land rent, and he discussed especially finance capital. He pointed out that banking and finance 
uh, increase, uh, not because of, of uh, the means of production. They're not rounded into the means of production. If you owe money at a rate of interest, the money continues to grow interest whether or not the debtor can afford to pay. That's what you're finding in America with defaults. 10 million American families have defaulted uh, on uh, their mortgages. Uh, the same thing you found in Ireland, you're finding it in Greece. Uh, so you're finding a, a kind of reduction to austerity now. And yet all of this can be uh, analyzed in terms of uh, Marx's exposition of uh, value theory. Value, price, and rent. Uh, prices, Marx said, are much higher than actual uh, cost value. And they're higher because of what he called fictitious costs or unnecessary costs. He said there is no necess necessity for uh, people who rent houses to pay a rent to the landlord. You don't need a landlord class. Uh, and he called them the excrescences of production. The same thing with bankers. He said uh, uh, the task of capital, uh, industrial capitalism, would be to take banking out of the medieval feudal era and instead of making predatory loans to consumer loans, uh, to force them into bankruptcy, instead of making loans uh, to governments, uh, banking would become industrialized and for the first time in history, banks, according to Marx, would lend to finance the creation of uh, new capital goods, to build factories, to build means of production. And in his day, this was actually occurring in Germany. Uh, and when World War I broke out, there was a great debate uh, that occurred among English economists. They said uh, they worried that England and the Allies might lose World War I because, uh, they said, uh, Germany and the central uh, powers of Europe uh, middle, middle Europe uh, has a productive financial system that can finance uh, industry, uh, whereas the British uh, financial system, like the American system, the Anglo-American system, basically is asset stripping. It makes loans simply to extract dividends, to get as much money out of the factory as it can, and to get and to use all of the accumulated interest that it gets to make new loans uh, and uh, on more and more shaky bubble-type uh, projects. And uh, the result is that uh, England and America had had a failed system. Well, despite this financial difference, the Allies won World War One, uh, not uh, the Central Powers. And with that loss, uh, there was a whole change in the politics of the world, the organization of finance, and as Professor Romer said today, in the character of the socialist parties and the labor parties. Uh, today, one finds uh, the socialist and labor parties of Greece, uh, Europe, uh, the Democratic Party in the United States, arguing for austerity. Uh, not, uh, it's amazing, how can parties claiming to represent the working class say what we need are lower wages, what we need are higher taxes on us, and untax the 1%? How do, does it come uh, that they uh, uh, work, vote so much against their self-interest? I think we have to realize that, and I will have an explanation. Uh, what Marx wrote uh, was that the, the the debts tend to grow independently of the economy's ability to pay, and the financial sector grows faster than the industrial sector itself. Uh, and uh, in Germany, you had uh, uh, the analysis of uh, finance capital as opposed to uh, industrial capital, and uh, this became the basis of Lenin's uh, imperialism also, focusing on this difference. Uh, I'm going to argue in the time that's left to me that uh, what we're seeing today in the West is not industrial capitalism, it's the failure of industrial capitalism uh, to, and a lapse back into finance capitalism uh, that is represented as the post-industrial society uh, as if it's somehow gone forward, gone beyond industry, industrialism, but what it really is is a pre-industrial society. Uh, it's a kind of neo-feudalism, almost. Uh, you have uh, not only uh, a polarization of the economy, such as uh, Piketty uh, 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 described and others, but uh, you have uh, the emisceration, and certainly Marx talked about emisceration, but the emisceration, the misery, the poverty, is not 
occurring for the reasons uh, that Marx wrote about. Uh, he devoted volumes two and three of Capital uh, to analyzing uh, rent and interest. Uh, uh, and uh, the theory of rent was certainly picked up uh, in China by Sun Yat-sen uh, that said, uh, we have a landlord class here that's just as uh, burdensome for China as a Europe's uh, landlord class, and we have to solve that problem uh, uh, because of uh, the landlords are uh, ending up with the, with the wealth. And uh, especially in volume three, uh, Marx analyzed interest, and he, just, he, more than any other economist of his day, he described the characteristics of finance capital and how it differed from uh, industrial capital. But uh, this wasn't what he wrote about in volume one. And uh, what Bertel has been uh, focusing on largely is uh, what Marx did write in volume one. And the reason, uh, in volume one, he wrote about the relations between labor and uh, its employers, uh, the capitalists. And uh, uh, he said, well, uh, prior to 1848 uh, and the revolutions in Europe, uh, most people thought that landlords were parasites, were predatory, the idle rich, and they thought that bankers were predatory. They didn't think that, there, that uh, employers were exploitative. Uh, employ industrialists gave work, and what Marx showed was that uh, wage labor was itself a form of exploitation that the other earlier economists had not discussed. And it was Marx that added it to classical economics. Uh, on the one hand, the, uh, the analysis of the exploitation of wage labor by uh, its employers. And on the other hand, uh, uh, the uh, former, the exploitations of the feudal society. And Marx believed, well, every, uh, if I, you're going to project the future, what do you do? You expect every class to act in its own self-interest. So Marx uh, helped form, found the International Working Men's Association, and uh, it sought to uh, support labor's interest to get higher wages and better working conditions, shorter working hours, pensions, health care. Uh, we know that. But uh, more important, uh, and what is often uh, ignored is that Marx thought that industrial capital would act in its self-interest, and industrial capital had as its political program uh, getting rid of the landlords and uh, uh, essentially industrializing and then socializing banking. Uh, and by the time uh, Marx wrote in the 1870s, almost everybody writing about the future uh, called it socialism. Uh, there was Christian socialism, there was Ricardian socialism from John Stuart Mill, uh, tax the land. There was uh, Henry George uh, with a land tax. Uh, there was libertarian anarchist socialism. There was Marxian socialism. Uh, from about uh, the, the 1880s until World War I, almost all of the world was debating what kind of socialism would we have. Nobody expected capitalism to simply uh, remain a market, uh, the way that things are organized. They, uh, everybody was talking about how do we change the kind of things that are in the market? How do we take the land rent out of the market? How do we get interest out of the market? And Marx said the industrialists uh, had an interest in this because the industrialists wanted to undersell their competitors in other countries and, and at home. And how did, the, how did an industrialist make money? Marx said by reducing uh, the price of uh, their products uh, relative to uh, their competitors. And uh, there are two ways of reducing price. One is to reduce wages, which is the class war between uh, capital and labor. But uh, the, even uh, larger in terms of statistical terms is uh, the class war of industry against landlords and against the banks. Um, well, things have not uh, turned out that way, uh, uh, basically since about 1980. And again, uh, you remember Professor Romer said the big change occurred with Ronald Reagan uh, in the United States. Uh, almost all of the trends uh, of uh, distribution of wealth and income were stable until about 1980. And then they went off the tracks. All of a sudden since then, there's been a great polarization. 
Uh, and a number of things happened in 1980. It wasn't simply Ronald Reagan. Uh, you had, in 1980, uh, a steady rise of interest rates from the end of World War II, when uh, all the governments kept their interest rates low. Uh, you had a steady rise uh, as uh, economies uh, grew and recovered, and especially the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War distorted American uh, uh, capitalism and the American economy and created a, a crisis because the uh, incomes were paid to workers not to produce their own uh, consumer goods and not even to produce capital goods, but to, uh, to produce a military uh, uh, goods, the military industrial complex. Uh, and this uh, uh, created such a crisis that interest rates rose to 20% for prime corporate borrowers at the beginning of 1980. Well, uh, since 1980, for the last 35 years, you've had a reversal. Uh, the, uh, largely thanks to the fact that the Americans stopped uh, paying for wars in gold, uh, you have interest rates decline all the way to below 1%. You've had, in America, the largest bond, bond rally in history. In other words, bond prices in the last 35 years have gone up more than uh, any other time uh, in historical records. Uh, and when the interest rate goes down, that means that the price of a bond goes up. Uh, the result uh, of uh, banks creating money and uh, the central bank uh, fueling an inflation uh, has been that uh, the holders of these bonds and stocks and real estate, uh, with interest rates going down, you can borrow more and more money to buy buildings. And so uh, homes and property have been rising in price because not only of lower interest rates, but because of uh, easier credit. None of this uh, decline in interest rates uh, and the uh, creation of a financial bubble uh, is inherent to industrial capitalism. It's a finance capitalism uh, phenomenon, and it's a phenomenon that uh, Marx discussed uh, uh, in volume three. So, uh, this brings us back to, uh, I think, the, uh, where Professor Romer began his talk was uh, citing uh, Piketty's, uh, the statistics on the concentration of wealth and uh, the ratio of wealth to income. But uh, what really is wealth that we're talking about? There are two ways in which people use the word wealth. One is, I'm sure, uh, especially uh, in China and Marxists, you think of the means of production. You think of factories, farms, and things that produce things. But the other kind of wealth is the antithesis, the opposite. It's, it's finance, it's debt. If one person, if you have savings, and savings are lent out, uh, then uh, one person's wealth in the form of savings equals another person's debt. So the opposite of wealth is financial debt. And what you've had in uh, all economies, uh, from the United States uh, to Europe, and now I understand also in China, is an increasing uh, rise in debt uh, relative to output, relative to wages. In the United States, uh, the, the federal government uh, now guarantees the mortgages that banks write. Banks will not write a mortgage these days unless the government promises to buy it if uh, the uh, borrower can't pay. And the rule is that banks are allowed to lend to borrowers money up to 43% of their uh, in family income. Now, just think of this. If you pay 43% of your uh, income for a mortgage and you deduct 15% of the paycheck for Social Security uh, and uh, medical care. If you pay uh, another 10 or 15% in taxes, uh, retail taxes and income taxes, uh, and if you pay another 10% uh, to, to uh, banks for student loans, uh, bank loans, credit card debt, you find that uh, in America, uh, the, uh, the workers can only uh, really buy about uh, one quarter of uh, what they earn on goods and services. Three quarters of what a wage earner earns in America goes to pay either the banks 
uh, or uh, the real estate owners, or uh, the government for taxes that have been shifted off wealth onto labor. Uh, and uh, I won't get into the technicalities uh, of how the taxes on labor have been uh, increased, but uh, uh, people didn't used to have to pay uh, social se uh, security taxes of more than three or four uh, percent. It's a disguised uh, form of, of taxation. Uh, when the American income tax was introduced, in uh, 1913, only 1% of the population had to fill out a tax form. 99% didn't have to pay the tax. And most important, the capital gains. Uh, the, the increase in the uh, price of property, the increase in stock prices, and the increase in bond prices is not taxed. And uh, all of a sudden, you have something that uh, nobody talked about in classical economics, and even Marx did not expect that uh, capitalism would become so uncracked that by far most of the money uh, that's been made, most of the wealth that's been accumulated, is accumulated in the form of the rising price of real estate. 80% of bank loans in America are to real estate. And a uh, home is worth whatever a bank will lend. So if prices here in China are rising for your housing, it's because the banks are lending people the money to buy a house. Because you certainly, uh, by the time you start a family, uh, you certainly don't have enough money to buy the house for all cash. You have to get the money from borrowing from a bank. And if a bank lends more and more money, the price is going to go up. Uh, and in America, for many years, the typical mortgage is 30 years. This means that the wage earner in America has to spend 30 years of his life paying for the house that he lives in. And he also has to spend many, maybe 10 or 20 years of his life paying for the education. And then he has to keep on uh, borrowing and going more into debt just to maintain a standard of living when his wages do not go up and all of these taxes and uh, goods and service prices go up more and more. So what we're seeing in uh, America and Europe is a monopolization of the economy uh, and a, a financi financialization. It's the new word that was added to the English language uh, a few years ago. Financialization means turning real estate and factories uh, into uh, a way of making money. Uh, the heads of uh, industrial companies in America are not engineers. They're basically financial, financial engineers. And they use the word in English, financial engineering. And it's obviously not industrial engineering. It's not engineering to produce goods and services that people use. It's uh, simply a way of increasing stock by using profits not to uh, reinvest uh, to employ more labor to produce more goods and services, which is what Marx described industrial capitalism as doing. Uh, it, if you make more profits, you either pay them out as dividends, you do just exactly what was the British were doing and were criticized for before World War I, or you uh, use the profits to borrow even more money uh, to buy the stock or to, you borrow to take over uh, another uh, country. So what we have is uh, a completely new uh, phenomenon. It's uh, not a form of uh, 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 equilibrium. Uh, it's a steady uh, deterioration. And uh, uh, I agree uh, with uh, what Professor Ullman said and what he will say after uh, I talk, that we are in something like a final crisis of capitalism because in every country, in Europe and the United States, there is no means of paying the volume of debt that has been uh, run up. Uh, uh, I think Summer Amin uh, today mentioned uh, uh, Greece. Uh, there's no way that Greece can pay the amount of money that uh, it's uh, owed. And so the European Central Bank, which is uh, the board of directors of the bank, high finance and the German banking system, said, okay, we know you can't pay, here's what you have to do. You have to sell off 50 billion euros of your property. Give us your land, give us your islands, give us your oil rights in the Aegean Sea, give us the Parthenon, uh, uh, give us your electric utility, give us your port, you have to sell it all off to pay your debts. 
So the crisis today uh, is not so much a crisis simply of workers earning enough more to pay their debts. If workers do get more salary in the United States, when they move into the middle class, the price of entry into the middle class in the United States is to go so deeply into debt to buy your own house, to buy an education to get a job, to buy a car to drive to your job, all on debt, that you have to work for the rest of your life paying off the bank. So on top of the exploitation of the employer that Marx talked about in volume one is the exploitation of uh, the creditors, the bankers, that he spoke about in World War III. And what do the bankers want? They want to foreclose on uh, the public, uh, in public uh, uh, infrastructure, on the roads, uh, the transport system, the airlines, uh, the water uh, systems, everything that you have. Well, already a uh, hundred uh, years ago, the uh, mayor of Cleveland, uh, Ohio, one of the industrial uh, cities of America at that time, uh, won election because he said uh, he wanted to uh, build a public uh, electric utility to produce low electric prices. And he, uh, he said, if the public doesn't own the electric utility, then the utility will own the public. And he said to voters, if you don't own the electric company, the company will own you. Well, uh, a few years ago, uh, a later mayor of Cleveland, Dennis Kucinich, uh, who was one of the presidential candidates uh, eight years ago, uh, said when uh, he was elected mayor of Cleveland, and the banks came to him, and they said, we want you to privatize the utility. Uh, if we, you can privatize the utility, we will raise the prices fourfold. We will make a 400% uh, capital gain, and we'll make you governor. If you act for the banks, we'll make you governor. And who knows where you'll go from there. And uh, he said, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to keep electricity prices low for Cleveland. Uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, ended up basically the uh, plank on which uh, he ran uh, for president. Uh, it may be. Uh, surprising, but if you look at the classical uh, debates that Marx described, they usually talk about three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. What they don't talk about is the largest uh, capital investment of all, and that's public enterprise. That's the government investment in roads, transportation, your school system, everything that is produced for free. And the objective of government uh, and, uh, infrastructure is not to make it part of the market not to make a profit, but to lower the cost of living and to lower the cost of uh, doing business for the population. Now, this is why the United States government in 1945, when World War II ended, was afraid uh, of uh, socialism. It, it was afraid of, uh, of letting Russia into the uh, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank because it said, socialist countries are unfair, they can undersell us. Uh, uh, if you have uh, public roads and public uh, utilities, you don't have to charge interest. You don't have to charge rent. You don't have to charge a high price. You can charge a low price or give the transportation for nothing. You don't have to pay high executive salaries and dividends. And so they said uh, they worried, strange as it seems now, that socialist countries could uh, outcompete. Uh, and that analysis is still applicable uh, to China today. Uh, the one, uh, what you're threatened uh, with uh, from the West is not uh, so much uh, Western uh, industry coming and uh, buying and helping you develop, but uh, adopting the practices of Western finance, the practice of Western banking and privatization, the, and uh, it, to the extent that you let private uh, bankers create uh, money, uh, that the, uh, they will create it for nothing on a computer keyboard electronically, just like the Bank of China does. You don't need a private banker to do this. And if you let the private bankers here to, make, to uh, do the banking and lend the credit, they're not going to lend credit to build factories. They're not going to lend credit to help employ you. They're going to lend credit for people to buy other infrastructure, to buy other factories, to uh, lend to the government, and then tell the Chinese government, well, uh, no, you have to begin selling things off, and you can look at what's happening in Greece as a dress rehearsal of uh, what can uh, go wrong. 
So uh, the common denominator between uh, what Rappel, uh, Ullman, and I are talking about is uh, there is a final crisis of capitalism now. Rappel focuses on uh, mechan uh, mechanization, uh, replacing workers, and I'm focusing on uh, what, what happens even if the workers are employed. Uh, they're being, uh, uh, the, the workers and their companies are being stripped by uh, finance capitalism uh, run wild. You've seen what happened uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Gromer said, well, they adopted capitalism. They did not adopt capitalism. They adopted the, uh, the opposite of Western capitalism. None of uh, the, uh, the uh, oligarchs in Russia spent their money building new factories. They spent their money uh, taking control of factories and selling them to the West that closed them down and turned them into real estate projects. Uh, that should be, uh, Russia's experience should be an object lesson for what to avoid uh, if you're a country that has uh, so little background in Marxism that you don't even know what, fi uh, what finance capitalism uh, is all about. And I hope what we do today uh, is to uh, give you the warnings of uh, what not to do, not to uh, accept from the West, because uh, what passes for economics in the West uh, is not simply a rejection of Marxism, it's a rejection of Adam Smith, uh, Mill, and the classical economics that everybody held in the 19th century. There's been a rewriting of history to expurgate the whole kind of analysis that we are all here together trying to develop uh, at this meeting.